Heavenly Father, again we have come to this moment in time when we are helpless without your Holy Spirit's guidance. So again I ask, Heavenly Father, that you will speak through me to the hearts of your listening people. Again, as I seek to speak forth your word of truth and life, may self be crucified. And may Jesus Christ and him only be lifted up and seen. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12, the passage that was selected and was so beautifully read this afternoon by Sister Smith. And as those words echo in your ears, nobody, nobody could understand this better than Adam had he been here. You see, in Luke's maternal genealogy of Jesus, Luke said Adam was the son of God. Adam was blessed with the intelligence that could not be matched by any other creature. Spirit of Prophecy says he was magnificent in stature, over 18 feet tall, if you please. Adam was destined to win. And that's the title of the message. Destined to win. Adam coming from the hands of the creator was destined to win. But to my chagrin, Adam failed his very first test. Can you imagine that? And yet, something goes wrong. And you lose hope. And you are ready to give up. Adam, created perfect, failed his very first test. Brothers and sisters, Adam came from the hands of the creator perfect. And as a result of Adam's failure, what do we see as a result? A change in nature. So deep rooted was this change that Adam's son, Cain, killed his brother Abel. The first murder was committed. And the sad part about it this afternoon is that the murder was committed based on worship. We don't know the environment, but one thing we know, it was open. Well, we are not a church because you're in a building. We're a church because we have come together. So anywhere there is you plural and you singular, anywhere you are, the church is. Did you get that? You are the church. So, the first murder was committed at church time. Mm -hmm. You see, Adam's son, Cain and Abel, they chose different professions. Abel was a sheep herder. Cain was a farmer. Whatever God says he means, God required of them because of Adamic sin to offer a sacrifice in coming to him. Not just any sacrifice, but blood had to be spilled. So every day, Cain 
had to go across to his brother and trade. He had to trade for one of Abel's lambs. One day, he got tired of trading. Sometimes, people get tired of doing what is right and begin to rationalize and compromise to have it their way. That was Cain's problem. He felt that as a farmer, he had beautiful fruits. They were spotless. And he decided that he was going to give from the trees that bore the first fruits. That's what God required, says he. Began to rationalize. So this particular day, Instead of going to trade with Abel for a lamb, a spotless lamb, he brought fruits, placed it on his altar, as opposed to placing a lamb. Abel did exactly as he was accustomed to doing, brought the lamb. Cain brought fruits. The question is, were those fruits good? Were they the best? Yes, they were good. Yes, they were the best. The problem is, God did not ask for fruits. No matter how good they were, God asked for a lamb. And so they began to pray and worship and pray and worship as usual. As usual, God accepted the blood offering. And to Cain's surprise, I wonder why he was surprised. God rejected his fruit offering. And the rejection of his offering created jealousy in his heart. So jealous was he that he rose up during worship and killed his brother. And I'm saying, brothers and sisters, that there are times when we commit murder in church. You think of the many times we talk stuff that we shouldn't talk about another brother and another sister. That's a crime. That's a sin. That's murder because some of these sins are dissecting people's character. I want you to put it in perspective. The first murder. Destined to win. Born to triumph. But I don't see triumph in that. So I continue reading the book. I continue reading the book, and it takes me to Father Noah. Are you with me? Now, he was a good man. He must have learned about the plan of salvation from Adam. But Noah lived jointly, concurrently with Cain. You see, Cain killed his brother Abel and fled with one of his sisters into a place called Nod, the land of Nod. And there he resided and he made a pledge that he would never again worship the God of his father. And so Cain started to worship idols. Heathenism developed. Adam and Eve had another son. His name was Seth. Set, grew up. 
hearing the story about his brother and pledged that he would never stray from the God of his father. So listen to me. I want to correct a biblical error here. As Seth grew up and took himself a wife and started his own generation, Seth made sure that his generation stayed with God. Seth's generation became known as the sons of God. Are you with me? On the other side, Cain's generation became known as the sons of men. As time went by, Seth's generation heard more and more about their relative Cain's generation. So after a while, although they were forbade not to, they went down and Seth's generation, the men went over and start into marriage among Cain's generation. So when you hear the Bible says, the sons of God went and married the daughters of men, don't allow anybody to tell you that's angels. Angels are spirit beings that do not engage in marriage. That's why I tell couples that you don't have to hide and even turn off the light in your bedroom because it doesn't affect your guardian angel. They don't have that problem. They are not, they are spirit beings who have no problem with sex. Hello? So worship all you want. And those noise you make are holy noise. That's all right. Huh. Oh, one of these days when I come back, I'll show you that sex is a form of worship. Now, you folks, if you understand, I said sex is a form of worship, but that's for something else. Are you hearing me? You see, and that's why those, those monks and those fellows messed up and used the, the nuns as vestal virgins, say they are worshiping. Uh, let's get back. The Bible says, now I found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Something was getting out of hand in Nod. Something was getting out of hand among Cain's generation. Because they got so far and so steep in sin and idolatry that they decided to build a tower to reach up to the heavens. And you know God confounded their language. God confounded their language. The earth was now overspread. I want you to follow me carefully. I'm taking you somewhere. The world was now overspread. No longer are they, were they just confined into one area, but now they're going to different places all over the earth because of the language. But they went with their even worship. So that there came a time when sin, God could take sin no more. He decided to destroy sin. But to destroy sin because they have those scattered over the world, he had to destroy the world. God has no desire to destroy the world he made, you know. He wants to destroy what? Sin. 
But since sin is all over the world, he has to destroy the world. And the method he chose was a flood. And so that's where Noah came into action. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Up to this time, everyone kept the original Sabbath. Somebody say amen. Everyone on God's side, that is. And so God called Noah to build the ark. God gave Noah the specifications, even the type of wood to use. And you know, Pastor Bernard, Dr. Robinson, I, 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 think, I thought about this. It's interesting to note that only Noah's sons and his son's wives listened to Amen. And it suddenly dawned on me that Noah had many other relatives. Also Noah's sons' wives. What happened to them? They have become a part of the mocking crowd. Family members became a part of the mocking crowd. Now what the Bible says, preached for 120 years, the longest evangelistic series. And as I looked into that intently, again, Dr. Bernard, I am flabbergasted because there's nowhere in Scripture where I saw anything different. 120 years preaching the same sermon. The theme of the sermon was, get ready, a flood is coming. Noah's destination became a tourist resort. The fame spread. The fame spread. Thank you. And everybody wanted to see this ark and to hear this man exposing that level of stupidity. A flood is coming. How stupid could anyone get? Where was the water going to come from? In those days, it never used to rain. This old man is really crazy. And so the ark became the spectacle of the time. And that destination became a tourist resort. So a day came because something was happening. Methuselah had reached the age of the oldest man. Spirit of prophecy says when this man Methuselah dies judgment shall come from the Lord. When Methuselah dies God shall send it. As a matter of fact, that's the meaning of Methuselah's name. Methu and Selah, a compound name, Methuselah. When he dies, God shall send it. Methu, when he dies, judgment shall come from the Lord. Spirit of prophecy says, Methuselah died a week before the flood. When this man dies, judgment shall come from the Lord. And so, 
for some unknown reason, only God knows it must be high tourist season. Because the crowd was bigger than any other crowd. From all over the then known world, people converged on the site where the ark was. And then you realize the God who we serve is a God who operates on time. Because if you were to fast forward, you will realize he waited also for Pentecost. When all the people in the then known world, we call them the Jewish diaspora, got back to Jerusalem, when they came back for a time of festivity, it was their pilgrimage, and they got back there. That's when things revealed. The same thing happened on that eventful day. And this is how it happened. This is how it happened. The flood was coming. They were all there. I don't know if they were taking pictures. Maybe they didn't have cameras yet, but we don't know. I am saying we don't know. Because believe it or not, I am one who believes that they were smarter than us. But something started to happen that should have triggered common sense. All of a sudden they saw animals. In sevens and in twos, entering the ark. Nobody was guiding them. You would have thought that these people would have stopped and said, That's strange. That's strange. Is it that the devil can get caught up our mind so much that we cannot even reason out the common things of life? Is it that we can get so drunk and in stupor that we cannot see the simple things of life and the truth of truth? They saw with their own eyes animals guiding themselves into the ark. They watched. And when the last pair of animal, which of course was the turtle, got into the ark, the Bible says, God says it's time now. And God says now. I'm going to close the ark door now. Noah didn't argue with God, but God did that for a reason. God knew the heart of Noah. God knew. Uh, Noah didn't know what was going to happen really. But God knew Noah's heart. That somehow when those rascals start screaming and shouting and psychophantically begging, Noah would open the door. I would too. So God closed it. Himself. It's a dangerous thing when God closes a door. Dangerous. Then you become a living dead. And there are people who have reached that stage. You get to that stage when you have committed the unpardonable sin. Punta final. No more repentance. But I can't point my finger at anyone. It did not rain the first day. Neither did it rain the second, third, fourth, or fifth days. And because it did not rain these many days, the laughter, the mocking, and the jeering heightened. It got to a crescendo of madness. 
How is he taking the stench from these animals? But on the seventh day, something started to happen. Something began to happen. The awesome battalions of cloud gathered themselves together and started marching across the sky. They had not seen that before. And of course, the crowd grew even larger. The sun started to grow dark as more battalions joined the clouds. They had not seen that before. Suddenly, the lightning flashed to echo the threat of God's wrath. And the thunder rolled to demonstrate his anger. They had not seen that before. They had never seen or heard what was about to happen next. Because they heard and they began to feel. They heard the dancing columns of rain as it hit the threshing floor. They felt it as their bodies began to get wet. And they looked up to the heavens and they said, it is happening. It is happening. It is coming. And in a chorus of psychophantic madness, now But it was too late. It was too late. Now let me just jump forward here. God says, after they were all destroyed, he made a promise to Noah. He said, Noah, it broke my heart. But I'm making you a promise, Noah. I will never destroy this earth again with water. Next time it will be fire. Who said those words? Now, have you psychoanalyzed God's word? Those words just revealed that the eight people who are going to start their families, they're going to become rascals again. Did you get that from that statement? I will not destroy this earth again with water. In other words, when I'm going to destroy it again, it will be fire. God did not use any if clause. It's when. But watch this, folks. The Bible says, as it were, in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now watch this. Don't miss this. In Noah's day, it never rained. But water came down from heaven. God stored water under the earth. Are you hearing me? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in our day. Well, we don't have fire raining down. That happened one time. Sodom and Gomorrah. But the world has never seen that. So God says, as it was in the days of Noah, where water came from above and water came from beneath, he's going to send fire from above and he's going to send fire from beneath. And you better stop wondering how he's going to do that because a volcano is still going on right now. Fire is already reserved under the earth. And those of you who think you can get in your yacht to escape, I have news for you. The most oil is on the water. 
God has already taken care of this business. There will be nowhere to run. It makes good sense to make your calling and election sure. This sermon is not to scare anybody. It's just to tell you that what God says he means. Let's stop playing church. It's high time to get serious. I tell my wife all the time now, at this age and stage of my life, I can't afford to miss heaven. There was a time I used to wrestle with church folks. To get God's work done. I stopped that foolishness. God is big enough to fix any one of you. So if they want to quarrel and fight their way out of heaven, don't ask for my help. My responsibility is to help you to get sober. Get sober. Because the Bible says, after the flood, Noah was forced to change his profession. Mm -hmm. He had to give up sheep herding. And he became a farmer. And the, the history says, among the things that Noah planted was grapes. Noah planted a vineyard. And I guess he didn't have much to do because for some reason Noah was playing with his grapes. And one day, Dr. Robinson, he discovered the fine arts of making wine. Yes, Noah stepped out of the box and developed his creative energy. He discovered how to make wine. And I don't know how it went, but I believe he was testing it one day. And he took a cup full. And it felt good. He took two cups. And he began to laugh and dance. And Noah took a jug full. And he flipped out. Lost all consciousness. The Bible said he pulled off his clothes. Naked. Noah was drunk. There are a lot of people who are in church drunk. You may not be drunk with wine, but drunk with insularity and stubbornness and stupidity and simplicity. And you know what? Drunk in the ocean of opportunity. Opportunity passing you by because you are drunk. You came here for a purpose, I would imagine. And you are forgetting why you are here. This is not your home. We're all passing through. Don't get comfortable here. That's why the scripture teaches that we are ambassadors. Heaven is our home. Hallelujah. Don't get too comfortable here. Plan to go home. You're only representing heaven here. You're an ambassador. And you must understand that because you're an ambassador, you have some special characteristics and rights. Can I share with you as I close? Every ambassador has certain rights and privileges. But first, you must know who you are. 
you are representing your country while living in another's country. An ambassador has what is called diplomatic immunity. Do you know what that means? It means that if you do anything wrong in the country you are living, they can't even touch you. Diplomatic immunity. That's why the owner of WikiLeaks found asylum in an embassy. Can't touch him. But it's more than that. It's more than that. I want you to get the spiritual concept. If you are really an ambassador of Christ, what it actually means is that if you are going through any type of struggle and trouble down here, it's because Jesus Christ has invested in you. Because you can't go through trouble and struggle unless Jesus gives the devil permission to mess with you. Put it in perspective, saints. Unless you know deep in your heart that you're a rascal. But if you know that you have given it to Jesus and struggle is coming your way, then it's because Jesus has selected you to be an obstacle. For angels and men, and he's depending on you because he has chosen you to go through this trial. Don't let him down to thine own self. Be true, because the devil cannot have his way with you unless he gets permission from headquarters. Tonight, as we close, as we close, born to triumph, destined to win, I'm going to close on this note. Your pastor is an evangelistic machine. He knows how to win souls. But his primary way of winning soul is this way. Don't you forget it. Your pastor is your shepherd. Are you hearing me? He is primarily your shepherd. There is no shepherd who has, well, shepherds take care of sheep. Am I right? And I like the way he interacts with the sheep. He knows them by name. He knows how to pat them. Huh? So shepherds, Take care of sheep. Mm? Well, what else you know? Let me tell you. Shepherds can't produce sheep. Do you know any shepherd that can produce sheep? Only sheep can produce sheep. Hey! Only sheep can produce sheep. So the shepherd takes care of the sheep. The shepherd nurtures the sheep and the sheep reproduces and produce sheep. If you understand that concept, we can have baptism every week. Because I'm going to say something now that I can say because my time is up. I'm gone. I discovered, and my wife will tell you, I told them as plain as day, you folks in church, no, I'm not talking to you, I'm only telling you what I told my church, okay? I said, you folks don't have any friends. I said, you don't even know how to make friends. I said, we are planning for a crusade in July. And I'm giving every one of you an assignment. 
A lot of you live in apartment building and you don't who know who lives across the door from you. You don't even know who live on the next door. You don't know how to make friends. And we are planning this crusade for July. And I am saying every one of you need to bring a friend. Start searching for one from now. Bring a friend. I'll tell you what happens in my church. When we have programs, church is packed. And when you check it out, they're packed with Adventists. Mm -hmm. I said, how under God heaven are you witnessing? You can't witness to your own. It's because they have cut off themselves from the world and they have no Gentile friend. Well, if that's how you are living your Christianity, you are failing God. That's was the disciples' mentality. Jesus saw that mentality and decided to change it. And when Jesus ragged, radicalized himself and start mingling with the Gentiles, start mingling with the common people, the disciples couldn't take it. They said, Master, what are you doing? What are you doing? The question is, how can you fulfill Matthew 28? If you don't mingle. Am I making sense? How can you fulfill Matthew 28. If you don't mingle. Where will the pastors and the churches. Evangelism go. If all the people you invite to the meeting. Are your Adventist friends in Bronx. And you know where. You have got to mingle. You have got to mingle. And so I'm going to close off with. The paradigm shift. We're teaching our people. And I started it. I befriended the Sunday pastor. Mm -hmm. He becomes my buddy. And he, I counsel with him. And I listen to him. And I teach my members... The psychology of bring, making friends. I said, now a lot of you work in the medical field. Why don't you say to one of your friends wh with whom you're working for three, four, five years, so Tom, why haven't you invited me to your church one day? Tom is going to say, you are an Adventist and you wouldn't come to my church. I said, but you have never invited me. And he's going to take you up on the offer. And what are you supposed to do? Go. Go to church with her. Go to church with him. Don't invite her the next week. Got to show that you do have a plan. Now you would sell yourself short. Let some time run off. Maybe your church is having a special program. And then you go to that person and says, Roxanne, my church is having a special program this Saturday. I'm telling you from now because it's Saturday so that you can get time off to come. You are heaping coal on her head because it's going to be hard for her to say no. no. And so we have done that training with our church and the next step now is... Teach every member sitting on the pew how to be friendly. Because after you have done your hard work to bring that visitor, somebody sitting in the pew, sister, now you say, I'm not going up. <laughs> Church growth is not the pastor's job alone. It's for everybody. Because many times people can be turned off by people sitting in the pews. That's a new day for you folks. This is serious business. So we are teaching the paradigm shift. And that's why our district has jumped from two churches to eight. And my wife will tell you this morning, the ninth church called. There is a reason for it. Because it makes sense when people begin to feel a sense of pride, a sense of belonging, a sense of worth. A sense of camaraderie. Because there can be no true worship without fellowship. 
put that in your intellectual pipe and smoke it. There can be no true worship without fellowship. Sometimes we plan fellowship lunch and you're gone home. Folks, you need to fellowship. The Bible teaches that. The Bible teaches that. And I close by telling you that Jesus is coming back again. And he's nearer, much nearer than you think. Get ready. Because the hourglass of time has almost run out. Only minutes remain. It's no longer who you are, but whose you are. You are no longer connected to any family tree, but to Calvary's tree, because Jesus paid it all. God bless you. God bless you.